Do you think you're ready to test your geriatric medicine knowledge? Let's find out. In this trivia challenge, we'll cover four key areas of geriatric medicine. Aging and cellular senescence, comprehensive geriatric assessment, common geriatric syndromes, and clinical pharmacology. Each area includes three questions. One easy, one medium, and one hard. Worth one, two, or three stars. You'll have a moment to think before we reveal the correct answer, along with a brief explanation from Lecturio's expert medical content. Keep score as you go and discover how strong your foundation in geriatric medicine really is. Let's get started. Which of the following sleep pattern changes is considered normal in healthy aging? Changes in sleep architecture include reduced deep sleep, that's the slow wave sleep, increased light sleeping, that's the stage one and two, and more frequent awakenings. Older adults often experience changes in their circadian rhythm. This is called a phase advance. This can lead to earlier sleep onset and awakening times. Which statement best explains the paradoxical role of cellular senescence in health and aging? So recall that cellular senescence is there uh, in the healthy cell to block proliferation of damaged cells so that uh, we can have anti-aging effects and anti-cancer effects. But because we're accumulating damage that we've spoken about previously in this lecture, it leads to an increased rate of cellular senescence, which lends itself to aging. Which of the following best describes the Hayflick limit? And you're probably familiar with the Hayflick limit. Hayflick limit suggests that there are a limited number of cell divisions that somatic cells can go through before the telomeres become short enough to start doing damage to the, uh, I guess, sub-telomeric regions of the chromosome um, once the telomeres have essentially run out. It's suggested that uh, 50 divisions is about the maximum for any somatic cell. So after that, each cell division is shortening the ends of the chromosomes uh, till uh, we start actually nibbling away at the genes located on the ends of the chromosomes, which, as you can imagine, uh, can have some manifestations in the condition of the cell. So, You are seeing a 75-year-old woman who lives alone. Her son is worried that she is losing weight despite not trying to. What should be the first thing that you do? to what's going on. So I would check B. It's kind of like the newborn when you're worried about failure to thrive or the infant. Um, you know, the first thing you do is go to record and actually see, well, is this re a real result? Let's re retest the baby's weight. Here, let's see if the patient's actually losing weight. Because when I hear that issue, oh, doc, I'm losing weight, a lot of times I'll go back and six months ago, they had the exact same weight. Or sometimes they've actually gained some weight in the interim. A clinician asks an older patient to rise from a chair, walk 10 feet, turn, return and sit. The patient completes the task in 18 seconds. How should this result be interpreted? So one thing I really like is the Tenetti Balance and Gait Evaluation. The Get Up and Go Test is another term for this. It's um, sitting in a chair, then getting up, um, walking 10 feet in front of you, turning around, walking back, and sitting down. So um, if the timing on that is under six, 16 seconds, that's normal. 
There are actually some nomograms that, uh, that give patients a little bit more time based on their age. So if they're 94, they may not be able to do the Tinetti test in the same time the 68-year-old 68 68 year does it. But in a good general rule in my practice is if it's, on, if it's 15 seconds or less, they're, they're, gonna, they're okay. What does that mean they're okay? It means that their risk of falling is lower. A 75-year-old woman comes for her annual checkup. She lives independently, exercises daily, and has well-controlled hypertension. She has a 10-year life expectancy based on her comorbidity index. Her last pap test at age 64 and all previous results were normal. She continues regular mammography and had a colonoscopy five years ago showing no abnormalities. Which of the following best reflects an appropriate preventive care plan for this patient? Most exams aren't indicated that the life expectancy is less than five years, um, but I wouldn't just depend. I, I've got a chart coming up which uh, shows you uh, when to consider stopping these uh, screening tests for cancer, but in a very vital patient, don't necessarily think that just because they uh, have reached the age of 75, therefore it's, it's absolutely the time to uh, stop screening. Um, actually, it may be uh, better to continue to screen those patients. And in a patient who's 60, um, but facing multiple severe illnesses with a, a very poor prognosis, they don't, they don't necessarily need to go through cancer screening. They have enough probably going on in terms of their medical care, just keeping up with uh, appointments for multiple, multiple specialists, multiple tests and procedures. And therefore, you know, it's, it, the safe thing is always involve patients and or their caregivers in decision making. That said, cervical cancer screening, that one is more of a hard stop just because the risk of cervical cancer among women with previous normal uh, cervical cancer screening tests is very low. So no matter what their you know, level of vitality and their life expectancy is, if they have a, a several normal um, uh, pap tests in the past, I, I generally will stop uh, cervical cancer screening at age 65. Age 75 is definitely the year to stop screening for prostate cancer. Uh, consideration to screen, stop screening for colorectal cancer. You can actually, rec you can consider stopping breast cancer screening, um, but for a lot of women, they might go through age 80 or even 85 continuing with breast cancer screening. Which of the following interventions best support circadian rhythm regulation in an older adult with chronic insomnia who is largely homebound? For example, is the patient getting enough daytime bright light exposure to maintain circadian rhythms? This is an important consideration, especially in patients who are homebound or live in residential settings. You also can think about cognitive behavioral therapy, structured physical and social activities during the daytime, nighttime interventions to decrease noise and light disruption, and finally, discourage or limit daytime napping. Which of the following best characterizes the biological basis of frailty? The mechanisms underlying this decline can include something called sarcopenia, and that's a loss of muscle mass and strength. There's also a neuroendocrine dysregulation, and that's secondary to changes in hormones that affect energy balance and stress responses. And the most disturbing is this chronic inflammation, contributing to tissue damage and decreased function. A 75-year-old woman is brought by her daughter due to progressive memory loss and increasing difficulty managing finances over the past year. Her mini-cog test is abnormal, and laboratory studies including CBC, CMP, TSH, B12, and folate are normal. An MRI of the brain is obtained. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management?
So first line treatment for Alzheimer, as I mentioned, it are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, they can be uh, used in mild disease, which is when it should be caught. There's three agents available. They're generally similar in efficacy. One comes in the form of a patch, and that may be associated with better tolerability. Overall, you can expect mild improvements in both cognition and function. They're statistically relevant. Does it really matter in terms of um, something clinically that patients can appreciate? Um, generally, my opinion and an overall consensus is no. These drugs tend to hold the line and prevent, they, they promote a slower decline in cognitive uh, ability and function, um, but uh, they don't cause a significant improvement either for the majority of patients. Nothing that they'll notice. If there's no improvement, if the patient's continuing to decline six to eight weeks later, the medicine can be discontinued, and there is a, a significant uh, association with nausea and vomiting and weight loss and tolerability of these drugs um, is problematic. Which of the following best describes anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation in older adults? You may need to use them, to just be careful with them. Anticoagulants are underused overall for conditions such as atrial fibrillation. If you think about the average risk of uh, stroke in most older adults with atrial fibrillation is about 5% per year. Uh, the risk of a major bleed is well lower than that. Therefore, it's a, the benefit to risk ratio is still positive. Nonetheless, um, if patients are falling every, you know, every week, uh, that's going to be too much of a risk, and therefore that needs to be corrected before considering or continuing anticoagulant therapy. Which of the following best reflects current recommendations regarding antipsychotic therapy for agitation in dementia in older adults? Antipsychotics in of themselves associated with a higher risk of fall and fracture, also associated with a higher risk of mortality overall. So really should be avoided when they're absolutely necessary in cases of uh, dementia with severe agitation, uh, shared decision-making should be practiced uh, with a family. Maybe it keeps the patient in the home as opposed to going to an assisted living facility, but at the same time is associated with a higher risk of death. An 88-year-old woman presents for routine follow-up. She lives independently, but reports feeling lightheaded when standing and has had two minor falls in the past month. Her current medications include lisinopril 20 mg daily and hydrochlorothiazide 25 mg daily. Blood pressure readings are 116 over 68 mm of mercury sitting and 104 over 64 mm of mercury standing. She denies chest pain or dyspnea. Physical examination and basic labs are otherwise normal. Which of the following is the most appropriate management step? And then antihypertensive drugs. Uh, the, the systolic blood pressure uh, per JNC8 guidelines may be allowed to increase to 150 uh, among older adults above age 60. Um, I generally will try to be a little bit more strict with my control, but certainly above age 75 or 80, um, the BP uh, can become a liability when it becomes too low, and too low might be like 110. Uh, so therefore, it's something to consider. They, patients may need a down titration of their antihypertensive drugs as they move into that category above 75 or 80 years. And that's a wrap. How many stars did you earn? If you scored 3 to 12 stars, you're a geriatric rookie. A solid start to your learning journey. If you scored 13 to 25 stars, you're a geriatric pro. You've built a strong foundation of knowledge. And if you scored 26 to 36 stars, congratulations. You're a geriatric master, well prepared to tackle complex clinical scenarios. No matter your level, keep strengthening your expertise with Lecturio, your all-in-one study companion for success in clinical practice. Drop your score in the comments and let us know which area you want us to quiz you on next.